Uh, my name is Kim Williams. I'm from Kansas State University, and I'm going to follow up where Chad left off and talk more about some of the specific research findings that we've got on work with some of these bumps, blisters, and lesions, uh, specifically intumescence and edema. So where Chad left off was noting that with edema, the focus has been on plants being under being grown under conditions of, you know, excess moisture and limited transpiration. And so along those lines, I wanted to share some results with you from a research that was done many, many, many years ago now here at K-State by Valerie Jonas. And she was looking at uh, actually the effect of watering frequency on growth of IV geranium. But as it turned out, we were also able to assess uh, how much edema occurred under various watering frequencies. She basically weighed the pots before each irrigation so that they could be watered when the weight of the pot dropped by a certain percentage from container capacity. And in the overwatered treatment, which was essentially the pots being watered every single day, by anyone's estimation, these would be considered uh, overwatered plants. And the weight, the the pot weight dropped only 15% from container capacity, and then more water was put on. Those uh, representative uh, representative of those uh, uh, treatment plants is circled in red on the graph. The correctly watered IV geranium treatment was when the weight of the pots dropped by only uh, up by about 30% from container capacity, and an example of those uh, treatment plants is circled in purple in the figure. And then finally, we have the underwatered treatment, which were plants that were rewatered only when the weight of the pot dropped by 45% uh, from container capacity. By anybody's standard, these would be considered underwatered plants. They only got water every 10 to 14 days during the spring season, and those are represented with the sample circled in green. So, not surprisingly, the plants that had the most growth were those that got the most water those on the, the far left, the overwatered treatment. But what surprised us about this is that the edema was actually worse in those plants that received the least water. So that seemed to go contrary to the, the um, dogma that edema was going to be worse when water status uh, was such that water was plentiful and available. Now, we had two cultivars in these experiments, which were repeated twice, and the cultivars are old standards of Sybil Holmes and Amethyst. And one important takeaway is that the Amethyst varieties, which you can see flatlined on the bottom of this graph there, actually had very little leaves with edema occur at all. So there definitely was a, a cultivar response with Amethyst not developing this order, but Sybil Holmes, on the other hand, developing this disorder in response to root medium water status. When the pots were run too dry, the edema was worse. And so our two takeaways from this many years ago was that it wasn't constant water availability that contributed to edema, but instead perhaps more of a period of water stress followed by rewatering that more directly contributed to its occurrence. And a second important takeaway was that genetics matters, that cultivars differed in their susceptibility to this disorder. So as our research programs progressed and we had uh, more students join the program, another student, Nicole Rood, as we had lesions occurring both on ivy, geranium, and tomato, became interested in looking more closely at the anatomy of these different lesions. And Chad has already shown you some uh, great photos along those lines, but let's do a side-by-side -side comparison. If you look at ivy geranium on the left, you can see in this uh, mid-stage, intermediate stage of development that there's this bump, and it really doesn't look like any of the epidermal cell layer is involved. And remember that epidermal cells are kind of like the skin of the leaf blade, that layer of cells right on the, the leaf blade surface. It, it instead looks like on the ivy geranium, like it's the cells underneath the epidermis that are plumping up and pushing up against the epidermal layer. If you contrast that with a scanning electron micrograph of a tomato lesion, which you see on the right, it really does look like those epidermal cells, those skin cells of the leaf blade, so to speak, are individually expanding and then uh, bursting. 
So moving forward then to Josh's work with edema on IV geranium on the left and these intumescences on tomato on the right, you see this difference that we um, noted with regard to the anatomy of the lesions. On the left with the edema, it looks like many cells are incorporated into a single swelling or a single lesion, whereas with intumescence on the tomato samples that Josh looked at, individual cells were swelling. And so this is uh, associated with hypertrophy. And indeed, um, when Josh took cross sections of the leaves with the lesions on IV geranium, the cross sections did seem to confirm that there was no epidermal cell layer involvement, that it was actually the cells underneath the epidermis that were enlarging. Uh, that's the case in IV geranium. But then if you take a look at the leaf cross section on your right with the tomato, you can see that indeed it does look like it's those surface cells, those epidermal cells which are uh, enlarging and swelling and resulting in the disorders that we visually see uh, that can look very much alike by the time those cells all become necrotic. But they do seem to be different based on anatomy. So if we take a look at what the lesions look like on ivy geranium on your left and tomato on your right at the very latest stages, what seems to be happening with the ivy geranium is that, as Chad said, that bump will sort of crack or tear and then ultimately collapse. So in its latest stages, you actually see like a sunken area on the leaf surface, whereas with tomato, uh, the individual cells just kind of dry up and fall off and ultimately you have the necrotic lesions that begin to coalesce as many uh, epidermal cells undergo the, the progression through the disorder. So basically where that left us uh, is that we felt that the anatomy was different of the lesions on ivy geranium versus tomato. And so we began looking closely at causative factors. And there's lots of information in the literature um, dating back to the late 60s and early 70s and then through the 80s and, and now into the, the 2000s that really tie the occurrence, the development of these lesions on geraniums to water relations. Things like poor ventilation, conditions that minimize geranium's ability to transpire and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, we have experiments, for example, that were conducted by Nicole Rood uh, with tomato under a range of water status. And the range of water status on tomato had absolutely no effect on whether or not the lesions occurred. And then if we layer into that the recognition that light quality and or quantity, and specifically ultraviolet light, has been found um, by many researchers to prevent or reduce development of the disorder, which includes um, work in the mid-80s by Lang and Tibbetts. Uh, Nicole Rood also did work on this, and as I'll be showing you in a moment, um, work by Josh Craver here at K-State. It really uh, became clear that the lack of ultraviolet wavelengths of light seemed to uh, induce the occurrence of lesions on some crops. Tomato, a lot of solanaceous crops including pepper, uh, ornamental sweet potato, cufia, a potato. Um, however, the lack of UV didn't seem to have any effect at all under experimental conditions on the occurrence of the lesion development on geranium. So now we have two things. We have that on ivy geranium versus tomato, the anatomy of the lesion seems to be different. And then the second thing is that they seem to be related to different causative factors, water relations on geraniums and uh, lack of UV light on these other species. So what Josh did to uh, try to really focus in on UVB and whether or not it had an influence on the occurrence of the lesions in ornamental sweet potato was to um, build chambers where we could provide 
different light quality environments in the various chambers. And he had four light treatments. There was the control treatment, which was just our typical growing conditions in terms of light quality here in uh, Kansas. And this was light that was filtered through the glass glazing, but there was no other, anything else uh, over those plants except just the glass glazing in our greenhouse. The second treatment was one in which we supplemented the light with uh, UV. And so we had bulb in a fixture that provided additional ultraviolet light. And then we had a treatment number three where that same bulb was placed in the treatment, but the UV wavelengths of light that it emitted were blocked with a mylar sleeve. And then finally in the fourth treatment we had a bulb that provided, purported to provide a full spectrum uh, wavelength quality similar to outdoor conditions. So Josh verified or validated the uh, light that we were getting in these various treatments and you can see with the um, orange lines on the two graphs which represent uh, two uh, experiments that the UV light was significantly higher in that UV treatment compared to the other three treatments which are uh, close to none down on the, the bottom of those graphs in the with the green lines. And there were two cultivars in uh, these studies, Blackie and Ace of Spades, and you can see that across the range of light treatments, a normal UVB, UVB blocked and full spectrum, that there was really no difference in plant growth. We didn't measure different dry weights or different plant heights or widths or anything like that. So growth was very similar across all of these treatments. In terms of results, what we found is that there was, again, cultivar difference. In this work, the cultivar Blackie showed almost no intumescence, whereas the cultivar Ace of Spades uh, developed the disorder. And that's the result that you see, the Ace of Spade result on the graph on this slide, where the uh, two treatments, the normal treatment, which just had light quality that was filtered through the glass glazing, and that's the maroon bar, and then um, the UVB block treatment, which is where we essentially blocked all of the UVB coming from uh, the, the uh, bulb, had the most effective leaves per plant. Whereas our uh, UVB treatment, which is the orange bar, marked C, had the least affected leaves. So it did seem then that the that a little bit of UVB was indeed helping to minimize the occurrence of this disorder on ornamental sweet potato. But it didn't completely prevent the occurrence of the disorder. So a bit of UVB radiation was not 100% effective in, in uh, preventing the occurrence of intumescence. And uh, we speculated that, of course, with um, leaf canopies, uh, having larger leaves that are going to shade lower leaves on the plant and Josh noting that intumescences did tend to start and occur first on leaves that were shaded by other leaves. And he took some measurements of UVB levels at the, the upper leaf canopy as well as, the, as below those leaves and found, of course, not surprisingly, significant differences in the amount of UV that was available to leaves lower in the canopy. So just to take a look at uh, a few images uh, that Josh took with the scanning electron micrographs of the early on the left and then intermediate stages um, in the panels on the right, you can see that again, we definitely seem to have epidermal cell involvement in that it's those, those layers right on the surface of the leaf blade, the layer of cells that are beginning to swell and hypertrophy. What's a little bit different here is that stomates are distinctively involved, not in every single lesion that occurs, but in many of the lesions, they often occur around the stomate. And stomates, of course, are those specialized cells on leaf blades which open up to allow carbon dioxide into the plant for photosynthesis and then also to allow water out of the plant via transpiration. So there's a connection there in terms of what's going on with the water relations of the plant and development of the lesions. 
So as I just said, epidermal cells seem to be involved and with ornamental sweet potato and these lesions and that of course is based on these scanning electron micrographs but then when Josh did a cross-section of the leaves you can see that we suddenly became not quite as confident because um, you see that big uh, group of cells with the, which the arrow is pointing to and that of course is, is the intumescence or the lesion but it wasn't entirely clear that at least some of the epidermal cells were not just pushed aside and that we just had uh, cells right from right uh, in the layer right underneath the epidermis that were hypertrophying and sort of bursting through the epidermis so to speak. So where I'm going with this is that um, as we speak today, we cannot completely rule out a complex interaction between intumescence, which with the causative factor of the lack of UV uh, wavelengths of light and crop water status. Uh, because it really does seem that intumescence is a physiological disorder that occurs at the interface between the beneficial uh, very low levels of UV light and then the detrimental effects of UV light. Because, because of course uh, we spend uh, much of our lives trying to protect our own skin from the uh, cumulative effects of UV over time and in the photo on the right you see what happens under uh, just slightly too high UV levels of light where the leaf blades uh, sort of have, have gotten sort of crinkly and, and um, uh, we have this uh, kind of uh, puffing that happens and so UV is too high in those treatments but then with the image on the left we're reminded that when we don't have any UV or when so much of it is blocked by our uh, glazing material that the lack of it uh, can contribute to the occurrence of this lesion development and it really makes sense from the standpoint of the fact that uh, plants of course evolved under the sun's natural spectrum so it's not surprising that there would be uh, signaling of, of various pathways within any uh, given plant species that would be related to UV light. So um, we, we do feel like the UV light is a strong causative factor for the disorder that is associated with this epidermal cell involvement in intumescence, but we just haven't been able to show that with edema, uh, which seems to be more related to water relations on ivy geranium. And um, I am now really pleased to be able to share with you some of the results from our colleagues at Michigan State. Eric Runkel and Heidi Walliger were kind enough to share the next several slides with us so that we could pass on to you their results where they were using LED lights and um, happened to uh, find uh, some useful information, some very helpful information about the occurrence of intumescence under different spectra from LEDs. I'm going to show you results from three of their experiments and they have uh, published the highlights of this work in Greenhouse Grower. So in their first experiment they wanted to take a look at whether or not um, ornamental bed a variety of ornamental bedding plant species would grow similarly under light that was predominantly in the red and hyper red wavelength range. And so their treatments are summarized with the um, figure at the bottom of the slide. And so basically you can see that they had a range of red and hyper red, but the thing that's common across all of the treatments is that each of the treatments received 10% blue and 10% green wavelengths of light. Another really nice thing about their research that I want to mention before moving on is that in all of their studies, all of the treatments and all of the plants then received the same amount of total light intensity, so to speak, which was 160 micromoles per meter squared per second. So in this study then, to just reiterate a key point, all of the treatments had 10% blue and 10% green wavelengths of light. And what they observed that was across all of those treatments, one of the bedding plant species that they looked at was tomato, and, in, and specifically the cultivar early girl, they observed that across all of the treatments, these early girl tomato plants developed intumescences. They had a purple leaf pigmentation on the bottom of the leaves, and then intravenal chlorosis on the foliage. So they followed up that first experiment with a second study 
which have the objective of quantifying plant adaptations to different qualities of red, blue, and green light. So you can see that the treatment on your far left is basically 100% red and hyper red light, and then the treatment on your far right is 100% blue light. So they had a range of light quality in these treatments. And what they found is that the number of intumescences that occurred were lower on their early girl tomato plants as the percentage of blue light increased. So specifically, if we look at the red bar, which is the highest, though that was the tomato uh, plants that had the highest number of leaflets that had the lesions, that was all red and hyper red light. But then if we look at the blue bar, that represented the number of leaflets that had lesions at 100% blue light. And in fact, intumescences were completely absent in, these, in this trial under 50% blue and 50% green light. And then with their third study, they, determined, they wanted to determine the minimum threshold of blue light to saturate responses. So you can see on your left, they had a treatment that was 100% blue, and then the amount of blue in the treatments diminished as we moved to the right with uh, the treatment on your far right that was, again, just, just red and hyper red with no blue at all. And they also had a cool white fluorescent lamp um, in these treatments as well, in this experiment as well. And what they found in terms of results is that intumescences did not occur on early girl tomato plants when they were grown under 100% blue light. So you can see that it's, it's a really interesting piece to add to the overall puzzle, which is that it, uh, now that we have greater access to LED lights, it does appear that blue light, which is very near, of course, UV light on the overall light spectra is having a similar effect on abating the occurrence of intumescence as UVB light. So thanks very much to Eric and Heidi for allowing us to share these, these results with you. I also want to mention some work that's recently been um, uh, put out by a group of scientists at Lumagro, and they report decreased amount of lesions on basal as the amount of blue light in the LED spectra that they were growing the basal under increased. So in other words, the lesions on basal increased as blue light decreased, very similar to the responses that I just uh, shared with you from Michigan State's work with LEDs, except now we have a different crop with basal. And you can see uh, the image from their brochure, which is easy to uh, Google and request from LumaGro where you've got uh, what the lesions look like on basal plants. So here at Kansas State University, where are we at now and what are we doing with regard to these disorders? Well, um, thanks to some continuing funding from the Fred C. Glockner Foundation, we're able, uh, as we speak, to continue our screening trial work with QFIA, since there are a lot of new interspecific varieties on the market, many new uh, cultivars and so forth of QFIA on the market now. We're doing a large screen trial this spring to sort out which are uh, developing intumescence and which are not. And specifically, we're doing uh, experiments very parallel to what I showed you with ornamental sweet potato, except with some of those susceptible QFIA varieties, to try to really sort out whether UVB, and now we're adding in blue light from LEDs, can abate the occurrence uh, on susceptible varieties. But what's a grower to do? Um, if you're in the industry and you're having a lot of trouble with these lesions developing on your plants during crop production, one place to start is to take a really close look at the specific cultivars that you're growing. Because as you can see, one common theme throughout all of the results that we're presenting is that it does seem like there are uh, some varieties and cultivars that are more susceptible to the occurrence of both edema and intumescences uh, across a wide range of species. So just being able to avoid 
those growing those varieties especially if your production system is one that has a glazing material that blocks UV so if you're growing in a poly house under a UV blocked uh, poly glazing material then it would be something that you'd want to be more aware of just to avoid by selecting uh, appropriate genetics just avoid growing the ones that are going to be especially susceptible now with regard to crops like tomato Maxifort is a rootstock, so the occurrence of the disorder of intumescence on this rootstock is often really only a problem in like a healing chambers, which are um, sort of sweat chambers after um, plants have been tomato plants have been grafted. Um, and when when you do see intumescences from you know on on uh, breaks from the rootstock in a production situation, it's usually not a big deal because uh, that's not the uh, part of the plant that's bearing the fruit. But with cultivar early girl, of course, that's the, the fruit bearing, bearing variety. And so it would just be a matter of avoiding, if you're producing, say, tomato transplants, any variety that's tended to give you those problems if you're in a poly house. Chad has already shared with you the fact that we have 75% of our ornamental sweet potato varieties on the market that really don't uh, suffer too much from this disorder and we're trying to generate a similar set of information for you about CUFIA now. In terms of future options, based on the results from um, Heidi and Eric at Michigan State as well as what we saw from the LumaGrow group, it does seem like Blue wavelengths and LED lights can certainly help abate the occurrence of the disorder on susceptible cultivars or varieties. And there's been some really interesting work that's uh, been done at Arizona with end of day far red lighting that uh, might be a little more friendly for growers to adapt than um, having to deal with uh, UV light. So with that, I want to send a huge shout out of thanks to this group of, of students who have done the work that Chad and I have shown you today. Valerie Jonas, Nicole Rood, and then the bottom two photos are our student interns from Zamorano University in Honduras, Gabriela Cruz and Andrea Zario. But a huge shout out of thanks to the extraordinary Josh Craver, who did a fantastic work with us here during his master's degree. And very importantly, I want to gratefully acknowledge the Fred C. Glockner Foundation for funding of much of the research that we were able to show you today, which, as you noted, spanned um, several students' projects over many years. So with that, I want to thank you for attending, and uh, now Chad and I are both here so we can um, hopefully answer any questions that you have about the work.